I would like to move on to the next less, perhaps a bit less interesting topic, but it's still, for me at least, interesting to find out. How do you guys practically arrange the interview? So how many interviews do you plan? Is it a one big session of I don't know how many hours? Or you split it in several interviews? Do you have like a do you have a plan that you typically try to follow? And then you could also feel free to add like who do you interview? So which stakeholders are you gonna invite? And how many people are doing the assessment? So is it just you or you have a a buddy who helps you out taking notes? Um and I would like to keep it a little bit briefer because I'm going to give each and one of you the word because I know you guys do it different way. So let's start with, again, the other way around. Let's start with Brian first, and then we'll go to Maxim and Rob. Sounds good. So in, I'm, I'm going to have to give you the it depends. So... <laughs> It depends no. on who, who, <laughs> who we're assessing. Um, so I've done, I grew up learning to do SAM assessments on a massive scale where we would physically go to the company and spend three days of eight to 10 hours of meetings. And we would meet with an insane number of people, but we had a view and an understanding of what was going on that was unparalleled. It was an amazing investment and we could get all the way down the recommendations, including capital and expense recommendations. It was a crazy level of detail. That doesn't happen super often because really only very large enterprises, Fortune 100 type sized companies really need or desire that detail. Typically, I'm looking at meetings and most of them end up being remote just by the nature of things right now i prefer in-person meetings absolutely building that relationship that trust is huge um if we do virtual meetings i'm always on video because that's the closest i can get to being personal if it's just a detached voice it's really hard to trust um but typically i don't go over 90 minutes 60 minutes to 90 minutes at 90 minutes everyone's starting to wear out uh, it's hard to get good, solid answers. It's like a survey. After a certain number of questions, you quit trying to think about how to actually answer it correctly. Also, try to always have at least two people, if at all possible, as from the assessor side, because that lets you bounce. Because you can't ask questions, think about what to ask next, and write accurate notes all simultaneously and think about what was going on that you might be able to tie in that they had said at some other point. So having two experienced people being able to bounce back and forth asking questions is invaluable. It's also possible to do one and record the session and you can go back. You just don't get as much out of it up front because um, you, you can't ask as probing questions. You have to do follow up later. But generally try to roughly break it into business functions. I have a tendency to modify that a little bit. We generally, a lot of times I'll include all the architecture stuff together. So it might be some of design and a little bit of verification and then do all of the requirements, testing, defect management together. So kind of crossing over between the functions a little bit, but typically it's about five meetings, uh, approximately 90 minutes. And again, it depends on the organization. Sometimes I can get done in three or four meetings, and sometimes it takes six. It depends how talkative they are. It depends how much variety they have, how much detail they provide. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Thank you, Brian. Maxim, do you do things differently, same way, or what are, what are your, yeah, your experiences? I think my approach is, is quite advice. different. Yeah, I think my approach okay, is cool. quite, uh, quite different. So, um, I have like a quite structured approach. So in general, uh, uh, remember as a as a consultant, so um, upfront, I try to arrange that I really have the key stakeholders all in one meeting. Um, I start with introduction training on some, given that the company often uh, where I uh, where I'm doing work, uh, or at least the people that I'm interviewing, uh, often didn't have a lot of exposure before, and uh, then I do. Uh, two to three uh, three-hour meetings spread over a time period. So 
uh, yes, at 19 minutes of interview uh, interviews, people um, start to lose their edge a bit. Uh, but I I basically do a choose your own adventure approach to interviews. So I know some, I know the book. I um, so basically I, I wrote the choose your own adventure book or at least I have it in the back of my head. Um, and I'm just asking, depending on who I have with me, like, okay, uh, I'm a new hire. How does the mountain boring process go? And I basically take it from a sing single, very generic question to whatever they want to talk about. And at regular intervals, I check if I'm covering most parts of the of the model. But the goal for me is to really have a three-hour conversation, and ideally, in this conversation, speak to a lot of hey, uh, all of different people in the same meeting. Um, and it tends to work quite well. Uh, if I'm in, if I'm working with larger organizations, I do have to spend a lot of time upfront familiarizing myself with uh, their architecture, especially with their acronyms. Like if you have these large corporations, they have their own language between them. And I often really have to spend some time using the right acronyms and, and names of documents in order to elicit the right responses. Um, but for a small to medium sized organization, normally I finish in like six hours and have a really good idea uh, of what they got uh, going on and of their maturity. Um, if I don't have everyone in the same meeting room, or if it's a really complex organization, it uh, gravitates towards a, a, another additional meeting. Um, but that's the approach here. Um, on the remote versus in-person, I actually do prefer remote. I don't know. I, I, I still love the in-person interaction, uh, but I'm quite used to doing remote uh, meetings now. I find it really handy to have the recording and transcript later. So if I'm building a report, I'm able to refer to um, to what was said. Um, and I often take another person with me uh, to do notes or indeed to double check uh, if I if I didn't miss anything. So that's the basic approach. Thanks, Maxim. Rob, you, do you have like a third third secret option? <laughs> or, or is it somewhere in between? <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of things. Uh, by the way, this is all very inspiring to hear. Thank you, guys. Um, I We don't record. Uh, my experience is that it changes the dynamics. Um, I mean, it's weird, right? Because people are saying things and we can write them down. It's the same thing, but it's experienced differently. And I think you cannot record uh, in secret. Uh, I think it's even illegal uh, in some in some situations. Um, so we don't do that. So we have a note taker with typically expertise uh, in the area because then you can bounce back and forth. Sometimes it takes some time, you know, to think things through, and then the other can jump in. So you can also distribute some of that uh, uh, that thinking. Typically, we have a primary note taker, uh, but uh the other person also takes notes you have insights during the session that probably the other person doesn't have so you all you both need to have um uh, uh a pen and a paper not a laptop why not um you can hear typing and in a, in a session you can see typing which comes across as more distant uh, right because that screen is is in between you so i prefer to use pen and paper but uh, that maybe that's a personal thing. Regarding uh, the constellation of of sessions, it indeed depends. Some organizations have very different domains and realms, uh, sometimes even different uh, domains with governance. So you need to speak to multiple people how things are governed. Uh, mostly, uh, design implementation and verification are integrated. Teams are very you know T shaped, uh, but for example, in embedded. You're, you're dealing with teams that are focusing on uh, on design. So there it's different. Normally, when we do an assessment, we try to get a picture of this. So we need first to speak to people who know the organization. And then we do an estimate how many interviews we need for each domain uh, on average. We create sort of a, yeah, a, a budget for sessions. But as we go along, we learn that, ah, that person really didn't know what he was talking about. We need another interview. So you need some slack in, in the number of interviews that you're, that you're allowed to do within the, within the budget. And depending on how sensitive things are, uh, for example, if you know that the organization is really, has really low maturity and there's a high 
uh, shame factor also depends on the geography, of course. It can be helpful to do one-on-ones, uh, so for people to to uh, to to really open up. Uh, but if that's not the matter, you can uh, put larger groups together uh, and get more out of that. So yeah, like Brian said, and like also Maxime indicated, it depends on the context very much. Thank you. Just before we go to Maxim's. Uh question um, or, or comment, like more or less general rule. So Brian has five sessions of 60 to 90 minutes. Maxim has two to three sessions of two to three hours. Um, sessions like interviews. Rob, how, how what, what would you say like typical median? And sometimes for an organization, you just need one interview for governance and one for operations. But if they have uh, let's say they have three clusters of teams that work in a very, uh, very similar way. Then you need to cover, you know, the the technical stuff. Um, and then typically, uh, if you have the right person, you can do a one on one and be finished in two hours. It it is possible, uh, but do allow for a small break uh, halfway because uh, I agree with Brian. And this is, I guess, Maxim, also your experience that some at some point people start to uh, to wear out a little bit, or they need yeah. a bio break. So a little break is uh, is good, I think. Yeah, let okay. it be clear from I, I'm not getting... these three hour yeah. meetings. Sorry, there is a there is a break, huh? uh, but I like to dive deep in a topic myself and then just stay there for quite a while uh, and building off all of the information I'm getting. So um, a three hour session for me is a continuous proceeding inside and then being able to ask better questions with every moment. Um, what I also want to mention uh, is, Rob, because you mentioned you don't record. Um, so I do take notes on, uh, not on paper, but on like an e-ink tablet. Uh, same reason that you mentioned, uh, it just typing distracts for a lot of people. Um, but most of these sessions, we really hammer it down that this is not an audit. Like we're doing this some session for you it is for you to improve if you lie to me if you tell me um if you like if you bullshit then well we're just going to deliver your report that you're not going to have much use of so if you want it's basically like if you want to learn be honest um and i really try to cultivate this atmosphere of, of openness and and uh, in my experience maybe in the beginning people are uh reluctant to answer but my my trick is basically to really dive into their context, into their world. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, use the right terms, really try to understand how, how they work, what their pains are. And after a while, uh, I really do tend to get a lot of very good answers with this methodology. Thank if you, I may, if, that brings me. If yeah, I may broader. respond, um, uh, yes, you're describing perhaps the most important uh, part of the uh, interviewing skills to create rapport, uh, to set the stage for openness. And it's it's hard to describe how you do this. Sometimes it's in your non-verbals, it's in, you know, letting people speak, it's showing credibility, right? People have a hard time explaining how they work when they fear that it's going to be misinterpreted because you don't know what you're talking about. So you have to do a little bit of bragging at the beginning or just go deep just to show that you, you will not misinterpret what they're saying, uh, that you have development experience, uh, that you recognize things. Um, and uh, it's, for example, le le let's take a tiny detail. If somebody mentions something really sensitive, like they take a pause and you know what, and then they say it. And if you then do like this and you go down to your notebook, it's it's they will feel okay he's he's snitching on us so even sort of hiding the fact that you're writing down this thing maybe if somebody says really sensitive you shouldn't write it down and keep it in your mind and write it down later it's it's the little things like that and like you described maxime creating that's that stage of of of, of honesty that if you feel that uh that the rapport that the trust is there i think you can you can record you can set the stage for uh, for for recording. Uh, mostly, I'm too sort of. Uh, yeah, it's I find it too riskful in the situations where I am. Yeah, 